Good evening and welcome to California Today. I'm Daniel Hall, sitting in for Lang Jang. Here's a look at some of today's stories. The election results to recall the San Francisco District Attorney are in. Our very own David Lamb spoke to one of the activists behind the historic recall. The Secretary of State posted incorrect election dates in an email to voters. Though she issued a correction, a former advisor to the Trump administration said that sort of error is unacceptable. Voters in San Francisco have recalled the district attorney who's known for his progressive policies on crime. NTD's David Lamb speaks with one of the founders of the recall campaign. The results came in from the Department of Elections and nearly 60% of voters voted to recall the San Francisco District Attorney Chesa Boudin out of office. Now many Californians are unhappy about his policies, saying that he's too soft on crime and pro-criminal. Now earlier I spoke to Richie Greenberg, a political commentator and also the one who led the campaign to recall Chesa Boudin. Well, no, I wasn't surprised. We were uh, we were happy, you know. Uh, but uh, the thing is that um, we were seeing a very high amount of advertising against us by Tressa Bodine's side in the last month, and especially in two weeks before uh, Election Day. A lot of negative uh, attacks, you know. And so that was a concern, of course. We were... Um, watching social media. We were listening to uh, what they were saying on their TV advertisements, and there was a bit of concern. But we kept seeing the results of the polls. There were five or six credible polls over the last few months, and especially in the last one week. And um, they all showed that we were going to succeed between 55 percent to almost 70 percent. And so ultimately, when uh, the first report from the Department of Elections came through at quarter to uh, quarter to nine last night, 845, uh, we succeeded. And so that was both a sigh of relief and uh, you know, a bit of joy. Now, this uh, recall has been labeled as a Republican recall. And, you know, there's and you've also said that it's nonpartisan. Um, what do the results say? You know, like, is that true or not? Oh, absolutely not true. You know, this was one of those scare tactics that Bodine and his camp were using to try and persuade voters that uh, voting yes to recall him was siding with the Republicans, that this was somehow not a legitimate um, uh, democratic process even. And ultimately, and this is the most important point, the Department of Elections and data analysts that are election analysts <clears throat> what they did is they were able to map the results where all the uh, votes came in and put it onto a map of San Francisco. And you could see that the, that the votes to recall him were spread out across the entire city, uh, regardless of whether the, the areas were more progressive and liberal or moderate or even slightly conservative. So complete false narrative. So there's a lot of people that are un that were and, and are unhappy with uh, Boudin's actions and the way he handles certain cases. Um, can you give us a prime example of you know one of the criminal cases that that we're talking about here? Well, there's a very good one, and this was uh, the reason for us to go ahead and begin a recall. So back in um, 2020, the last day of the year, New Year's Eve. Uh, Friday, December 31st, we have this famous, uh, you know, unfortunate incident where we had two uh, women that were unfortunately just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and were hit by a parolee, <clears throat> Troy McAllister, that Bodine uh, decided not to bring in and cancel the parole. Numerous times this uh, McAllister had, uh, had violated the parole uh, regulations. And that particular day, the last day of the year, he was drunk in a stolen car with drugs and a handgun and uh, crashed and, and, and hit and killed these two women. So that is, uh, we saw that uh, even repeated after that with other circumstances where he was way too lenient and decided not to cancel parole and bring these convicted felons on parole back into jail. Um, and that's just one example of many. 
Do you think the next DA will be any different? Oh, absolutely. You know, Tressa Bodine never had any experience as a prosecutor. There is this loophole here in, in San Francisco that uh, you don't need to have prosecutor office experience in order to run as a candidate for the DA. And that's what happened. He ran in 2019 against three actual experienced prosecutors. So there were three and then him himself. Now, he's a charismatic person. He speaks well. And uh, he got the ear of voters thinking that uh, voting for him was going to make fundamental change in a positive way. So they elected him. And unfortunately, we found out very quickly that that wasn't the case, that instead his intention was to never really prosecute criminals. And, um, and the results are, are what we see. Um, and that's all from me. Uh, do you have any last thoughts you want to share? Well, the, the main thing about this whole recall is that last night when the results came in, um, I didn't think that we should be celebrating that much. Um, this is a bittersweet victory. It's a, uh, the recall is something that we should never have had to do that, um, you know, Bodine was not qualified at all to be a district attorney. And he shouldn't have been able to run. He shouldn't have been allowed to run. So um, we have to look at what happened. You know, people died. People were injured. People were beaten. Um, stores were looted. Businesses wrecked as a result of Bodine. So, of course, I'm happy. We are happy. But it's a bittersweet victory. Greenberg says a lot of Bodine's policies are based on his upbringing, as both of his parents served time in jail. Now I asked Greenberg, what are the chances of Boudin being re-elected if he decides to run again? He says, not very likely. I reached out to Boudin's office for comments, but he didn't get back to me by press deadline. David Lamb, NTD News, California. A military aircraft crashed in Southern California's Imperial County at around 12.30 p.m. The helicopter went down just west of the Glamis Dunes near the Naval Air Facility El Centro. Five people are presumed dead. Military and civilian first responders are on site. The Secretary of State posted an incorrect election date in an email to voters. A Republican administrative official criticized the mistake along with the integrity of the election. Before Tuesday's primary election, California Secretary of State Shirley Weber wrote the wrong date in an email to voters. Weber wrote in the June 6th email, beginning this Saturday, May 28th, early in-person voting is available in Voters' Choice Act counties. In her following correction email, Weber wrote, Please disregard my previous email. Election day is tomorrow, Tuesday, June 7th. Early in-person voting options available now. Former Trump administration official Rick Grinnell called for Weber's resignation. He told the Epic Times institutions that are conducting elections are led by totally inexperienced leaders appointed by one person. It's truly outrageous that we have the system that we have. It's political patronage. Grinnell also raised questions about election integrity in the state. He said, We're flooding mailboxes with a plethora of mail-in ballots. Everyone I know is getting multiple ballots, bad ballots, ballots for family members that have moved. The system is just a mess. California Governor Gavin Newsom appointed Weber as Secretary of State last year to fill the vacancy left by Alex Padilla. Padilla was appointed to the U.S. Senate after Kamala Harris was elected vice president. Several alleged sexual abuse victims of the leader of a Mexico-based church are speaking out ahead of his sentencing. They want him to receive the maximum prison time. We are here today to give survivors a platform to be heard because the criminal courts are not listening to all of them. This is so that every survivor's voice is heard, so that the sentence can be appropriate for the crime that was perpetrated. These human beings, children, I was a child when I was trafficked, sexually trafficked. I was tormented by this man. He is a sexual terrorist, and he has been doing this for years. Nason Joaquin Garcia pleaded guilty on Friday to felony counts of sexually abusing three children. He was arrested in Los Angeles in 2019. 
Garcia is a 53-year-old Mexican citizen. He's a self-styled apostle of the La Luz del Mundo Church in Guadalajara, Mexico. The man faces a maximum sentence of over 16 years in prison. The alleged victims are demanding life imprisonment. Along with Garcia, two more from his church were arrested in 2019. Together, they faced 36 felonies, including charges of rape, child pornography, and human trafficking. Most of those charges were dropped in exchange for a guilty plea, avoiding life in prison. In a statement in May, the church maintained that its leader was innocent and said it had full confidence that his innocence and honorability would be proven. Garcia's sentencing began today. We're going to take a short break, but here's a look at what we've got ready for you when we come back. A man pleaded guilty to defrauding the government of $5 million in COVID relief funds. We'll have the details on how he went about doing it. The city of Los Angeles is one step closer to banning flavored tobacco. We hear from a smoke shop owner to hear his reaction. And milk banks are one solution to the baby formula shortage. NTD's Eileen Ng learns how one company in Northern California operates. That and more on California Today. The San Jose police are investigating robberies in residential neighborhoods. Two happened during one afternoon. Patrol officers responded to two separate home invasion robberies in San Jose on May 31st. At around 4 p.m., five to six robbers were caught on a forward-facing dash camera when the driver was returning home. A woman's nervous voice can be heard trying to explain the situation to the police as the suspects fled the scene. Uh, I cannot honk. Uh, the, my husband is at gunpoint. I have an infant. Okay. Uh, and what and they are driving away. They are driving away from my home. Was there a car accident, ma'am? No. Uh, just give me a moment. There was someone was trying to rob our home. According to the police, the suspects appear to be the same ones who invaded another home earlier that day at around 2 p.m. They stole their vehicle from the garage and drove it to the second home. The police remind the public to be vigilant in their neighborhoods. COVID relief loans are meant to help businesses that struggled financially as a result of pandemic lockdowns and mandates. But some people have allegedly taken advantage of those loans. One Southern California man has recently pleaded guilty to sealing COVID relief funds. A 35-year-old man from Orange County confessed to using sham companies to obtain COVID-19 relief loans. According to a June 3rd DOJ statement, Raghavinder Reddy Budamala agreed to plead guilty to federal criminal charges of bank fraud and money laundering of over $5 million. Budamala allegedly applied for seven pandemic relief loans between April 2020 to March 2021. The Small Business Administration granted six of those loans. He claimed his three companies earned millions in revenue and applied for loans to cover payroll and business operations. After receiving over $5 million in funding, Budamala applied for loan forgiveness on several of the loans. According to the U.S. Attorney's statement, his shell companies all had bogus, non-existent, or residential addresses. Budamala bought three properties in Southern California, deposited nearly $3 million into his stock trading account, and invested in an EB-5 immigrant investor visa program. Authorities arrested Budamala on February 23rd after stopping him at the San Ysidro point of entry to Mexico. Budamala is scheduled to enter his guilty plea on June 21st. He will face a maximum sentence of 40 years in federal prison. Los Angeles City took a major step toward banning flavored tobacco. But as some organizations celebrate, others are not too thrilled. NDD's Jackie Rios spoke to a smoke shop owner to hear his reaction on the ban. With an exception for hookah lounges amid certain conditions, the Los Angeles City Council has voted to ban the sale of flavored tobacco and hookah tobacco in Los Angeles. We talked with one tobacco store owner in the city regarding his thoughts on this new ban. Marco Isa has been in the business for 20 years with two smoke shop businesses in the Los Angeles area. But I've seen so many products like, uh, for example, beer is being sold with so many flavors. The other day I went to the market and I bought some Bud Light with strawberry flavor. All the time they try to affect the smoke shop business. You know, I think as a person, if you're 18 years old, I think you 
could make a choice. Then they change it to 21. I mean, they're always making the business hard for the smoke shop. He's one of the retailers whose business may soon be influenced by the ordinance banning flavored tobacco products. Every single pack, outside and inside, it has advertised. As you can see, you know, big warning. Every single package. If Alice Mayor signs the ordinance, it will ban the city's 4,500 tobacco retail stores from selling flavored tobacco, including hookah tobacco. But existing smoke lounges will still be able to sell hookah products for on-site or off-site consumption. According to the California Attorney General's office, in California alone, 36.5 percent of high school students reported using tobacco products. Of those, 86.4 percent reported using a flavor product. And according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the tobacco industry has aggressively marketed menthol products to young people and African Americans, especially in urban communities. Marcos disagrees. Tell the truth, I don't believe so. The menthol itself, I used to smoke menthol cigarettes, Camel Crush, and uh, I just, uh, I prefer a menthol over a regular cigarette. But I don't think uh, I will stop smoking uh, if the menthol disappear. I'll find some alternative. The National Association of Tobacco Outlets previously addressed the council with concern stating, legal age adults who currently buy these products will simply find other sources. The mayor has until July 1st to sign off on the ordinance. If that happens, the ban will take effect January 1st, 2023. Jackie Rios, NTD News, Los Angeles. Amid the baby formula shortage, mothers are looking for other ways to make up for the lack of milk. Some turn to milk banks for help. NTD's Eileen Ng visited one in Northern California to learn more about how it works. Mother's Milk Bank in San Jose started in 1974 to feed premature infants. It is the oldest operating milk bank in North America. The milk is being delivered by FedEx now. So this is milk from moms that are donating. The donor's milk is shipped and dropped off at this milk bank where it gets treated and processed for other babies. The nonprofit is part of an organization called Human Milk Banking of North America, which establishes the standard for milk banks. Uh, the donors go through an extensive screening, similar to blood donation, and they get tested for infectious disease. Uh, the other thing that we do is we get consent from the obstetrician, so the mom's physician and the baby's physician, to say that the mom is healthy and the baby's healthy, uh, and then she's approved to donate her milk. They mix the milk from three to five donors to homogenize nutrients. The milk is put into bottles and heated in a water bath in the pasteurization room. Uh, so the bottles are submerged, and uh, that ensures that the the temperature uh, of the water bath in, uh, envelops the entirety of the bottle. The milk is brought up to 62.5 degrees Celsius and left in the water bath for 30 minutes. Then it's transferred into an ice bath to quickly cool down. The bottles are labeled, sealed, and put in the freezer. They are packed with dry ice so the milk stays frozen during shipping. When treated this way, pasteurized human milk has a shelf life of 12 months. Batista said they usually see milk shortages during the holidays and the new year. Shipping delays and weather conditions contribute to the shortage, but they are not short now. So we're actually seeing a, a, a big increase in interest of donor milk uh, in light of the formula shortages. Uh, and we're also seeing an increase in the, the uh, women who want to donate milk also. So it's, it's good uh, that we're seeing that uh, interest in donating milk and we want to make sure that our inventory keeps up with the increase in demand that we're seeing. During shortages, they would prioritize hospitals first over outpatients. About 60 percent of their milk goes to hospitals. Donor milk is mostly for medical reasons, but mothers may also order if their milk is not available or not enough, or the baby's illness would need donor milk to help it. Human breast milk has a lot of bioactive components in it that aren't contained in formula. And those bioactive uh, components and nutrients are beneficial for all babies. Most of this milk bank's donors are from California, but the milk is donated across the country. Now let's take it over to NTD's Thomas Christian for a sports update.
I'm Thomas Christian, giving you the California Today Sports Roundup. Catching you up on more of that classic summer baseball. Christian Vasquez one out single in the 10th inning drove home Trevor Story from second base to lift Boston to a victory over Los Angeles and Anaheim, California. The Red Sox registered their sixth consecutive win while the Angels took their 13th consecutive loss, setting a single season club record. The game was the first for Angels interim manager Phil Nevitt, who took over for manager Joe Madden fired earlier in the day. To make matters worse for Los Angeles, center fielder Mike Trout had to leave the game in the third inning due to left groin tightness. It's a bad day to be an Angels fan. Red Sox 6, Angels 5 in 10 innings. Guillermo Heredia, a late insertion into the starting lineup, hit the go-ahead home run in the seventh inning to help Atlanta beat visiting Oakland to extend its winning streak to six games. The Braves also got a pair of long solo home runs from Ronald Acuna Jr. He hit a 435-footer in the bottom of the first and a 464-footer in the third inning, giving him a homer and three consecutive at-bats dating to Sunday's game. The winning pitcher was Kyle Wright, who won his second straight start. Lou Trevino suffered the loss after one inning of relief. Braves 3, A's 2. Hugh Darvish blanked a weakened New York, allowing just two hits over seven innings, while host San Diego rolled to his fourth win in five games. Darvish had a no-hitter going until Mark Canna singled with two outs in the sixth. The San Diego right-hander opened the game by hitting three of the first five Mets he faced. He then retired 14 straight before Canna singled. The Mets lost Pete Alonso and Starling Marte to injuries in the game's first two innings. Alonso left the game in the second after being hit on the right hand by a Darvish pitch, and Marte exited after the top of the second because of left quad tightness. Padres 7, Mets 0. Phil Mickelson and Dustin Johnson can compete in the U.S. Open next week after the United States Golf Association announced on Tuesday that it will not punish those who joined the LIV Golf Invitational Series. Six-time major champion Phil Mickelson and former world number one Johnson are among the exempt golfers for the U.S. Open who are also scheduled to compete this week at Centurion Club outside London in the inaugural LIV Golf event. Johnson earned a 10-year exemption after winning the 2016 U.S. Open, and Mickelson secured a five-year exemption from his PGA Championship triumph last year. The USGA said its decision regarding the June 16th through 19th U.S. Open outside Boston should not be construed as the national governing body supporting an alternative organizing entity, nor supporting of any individual player, actions, or comments. The decision by the USGA means Mickelson, who has finished runner-up a record six times at his national championship, will get another chance to complete the career grand slam of winning golf's four majors. Johnson, speaking to reporters at Centurion prior to the USGA announcement, said he resigned from the PGA Tour and hoped he would still be allowed to play the majors, which are not run by the PGA Tour. And that's all for sports. That's all we've got for you tonight. You can join us again on California Today every weekday at 8.30 p.m. If you have any news tips or ideas for our show, or if you just want to let us know how we're doing, please send us an email at california.today at ntd.com. I'm Daniel Hall sitting in for Lang Jang. Have a wonderful evening.